Good morning, True Grace. Would you stand with me this morning? You know, it's funny. When we, we go through the week, there's a lot of ups and downs, right? And this morning, if you came in feeling weary, would you just raise your hand right now? Is that you this morning? Did you come in feeling weary? Awesome. Did you come in feeling broken and confused this morning? Would you raise your hand if that's you? If you came in broken and confused. Okay, and if you came in this morning feeling excited and full and ready to worship, would you raise your hand this morning? Awesome. Each one of you, every single one of you that raised your hands, each of you who didn't, you're here for a reason. God loves you. He chose you to be here this morning. He wants to have a relationship with you. And the beauty of our life is that even when we struggle, even when hard things happen, which they do, and if you're in it right now, it's real, but God has a future for you. He has a victory for you, and we don't have to live in the the hardship that we're walking through right now. So if you're walking in this morning with pain or with weariness, God has a plan for you this morning to encourage you and lift you up, and we're going to worship Him in victory this morning. You ready? You go be 
I've got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do Every song I stand And you never do So I put my hands Praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much I'm nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart
this morning as I was praying over these gatherings, something that the Lord really pressed on my heart. Maybe it's for one of you, maybe it's for a lot of you, maybe it's for somebody at home. But I really felt that the Lord wanted to say, He, the God, the creator of the universe, wants a personal relationship with you. He's not too busy. You are his priority. He desires you and he loves you. Would you guys pray with me? God, we thank you that as big as you are, you desire a personal relationship with each of us. God, that you care about us as individuals, Lord. You care about the small and the big, God. We pray that today we would encounter you in a new way, Lord, that you would show up and meet every person exactly where they're at, whether they're in this room, whether they're watching online, God. We pray that you would speak to them, Lord, that you would speak life and encouragement, that they would walk away from today feeling joy, that they would learn something new about you and your character, God, that they would know what you want them them to do in their life, Jesus. We thank you for who you are and that you, above the name above all names, would personally want a relationship with us. We praise you in your name, Jesus. Amen. Before you're seated, would you take a moment and just greet the people around you? Hello and welcome. We're so glad that you're here today. If this is your very first time, you want to say welcome. In the seat back in front of you is um, what we call our next steps card. And after the gathering, if you want to fill that out and take it to our guest services, you can exchange that for a free coffee and some information. Um, it's just our way of connecting you to what we have going on here at True Grace Church. Um, we have a few events that are coming up. The first is our women's tailgate party. Um, for more information and to register, please visit our website, but it's gonna be an amazing time for fellowship with other ladies and to watch the Seahawks bring it. All right, and the other event that we have coming up is our family pumpkin carving night. This is on October 22nd. Um, we supply the carving supplies. All you have to do is show up with a pumpkin, a smile, and bring your family and friends with you. It's just gonna be a wonderful night um, just to carve some pumpkins and have some community. Um, it's gonna be a great time, so make sure that you make that a priority to be there. One of the things that we get to do as a church is to be generous with what God has blessed us with. Um, in my life, I know I have seen time and time again um, how when I am faithful with my money to give him what is already his, he has shown up in some incredible ways, in ways that I didn't expect it. And so church, can we give generously and give um, not out of that we have to, but out of the joy that we get to? Can we do that this morning? Let's pray. Um, Jesus, we love you. We are so thankful that we get the opportunity um, to give of our money to you, Jesus. God, we pray that you will do incredible, amazing things, more than we can ever dream or imagine with it. Um, we love you so much in your precious and holy name. Amen. My name is Tamara Carlston, and I'm from Gallup, New Mexico, from the Navajo Nation tribe. I grew up from a Christian home. I was part of the youth group in the church. And then after I graduated from high school, I continued my um, education to a Bible college to further on my education. Things changed in, in my life. So even though I was brought up in the church and knew a lot about the Bible, my life turned, turned for the worse. I got curious and I started drinking alcohol. It kept growing and growing and growing. I, I, I was married and I got a, a divorce. I was depressed, I was mourning. I felt so alone. And I got into, um, un, um, I was in an abusive relationship and I was literally, literally um, in the streets and and the alcohol took its toll on me, as well as the abuse that, that was given to me. I was so sick, I was so sick, and I ended up in the hospital. And the doctors told me that my liver was, was shot, and I only had 25% chance to live. So that's where I knew that I had to give my life straight. I knew I had to, I knew my life wasn't right with God. I knew that once if I died right then and there, my life would end up in hell. So I called upon the Lord and if he would heal me, I would live the rest of my life for him. 
No, I know I believe in a God of mercy and grace because on November 22nd, that was when I was, that was like my last time I drank. I thank God for that because a month later, on December 20, 24, Christmas Eve, it's so special is that I walked out of the hospital. But I believe that it was God, God's mighty power. And one of the treatments that I had was, was a blood transfusion. My aunt, one of my aunts said, as they're doing this, you just pray that you pray for the blood of Jesus in your life. So that's what I did. I tried rehab. I tried everything. I've been in, in and out of court. But I said at that moment, God, that your healing blood will flow through so that I will never return to alcohol. He healed me because I was a lost cause. He gave me a second chance. And I thank God for that. Wow. <laughs> Tamara, thank you for sharing that story. Aren't you encouraged? Uh, anybody who's dealt with an addiction to alcohol understands what she's talking about there. And uh, it's so powerful to hear what she was dealing with, you know, in the hospital for a month, uh, likely to die, and then to see the, the gratefulness in her every Sunday as she uh, comes to church and just talks about what God has done in her life and the joy uh, in her is so great. So uh, she actually was part of our new members class that we had yesterday. Somewhere around 20 people came and became members of our church yesterday. Awesome people. Um, and I love that. Listen, there's uh, a lot that we don't have figured out uh, in our lives, right? Like new members don't come in and go, well, how do I become part of this perfect church? Because there is no perfect church. Amen. Hoping there'd be some amens there. Because <laughs> if, if you're all perfect, you better fire me and get yourself a different pastor, right? <laughs> And so um, I love that new people come in, and in our membership class, we just talk about, hey, we're all broken, we all have uh, issues, we're just trying to authentically follow Jesus in our brokenness and serve Him and bless others. And um, it's been a, a just fun to see people be a part of that. So maybe you're new here or newer around here, I want to remind you of this, There's, there is a God who's much bigger than you and I are. And we recognize that. Um, there is more to this life than just living and dying and surviving the day or the pandemic. Um, we, can, uh, we really can't live up to God's ways without God's help. Have you thought about that? I need God's help to live the life that God wants me to have. Uh, we admit that we're all sinners. We all need God's forgiveness. We need his leadership in our lives. And uh, his plan for our lives is better than our own plan for our lives. Maybe today it's a great day just to say, God, here's my plan for my life. And I will actually lay it down, and I will adopt your plan for my life. Come on, this is scary. Whatever it is. <laughs> oh, that's easy to do, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a challenge for all of us today to say, God, whatever your plan is for my future, I will lay down my plans, and I'll accept your plan for my life. Uh, I think that's powerful. I think there's a lot of people here doing just that. And I, sometimes I just want to just grab the church and just say, I love you. I admire you. You are fighting the fight for faith. You're not finding some excuse to give up your faith. You're not pointing to some hypocrite. Like you're really trying to live for Jesus. And that's not easy to do in the world today. In your business, you're trying to honor God in your life. Some of you in the business that you're in, in the job that you're in, in the work environment you, you're in, that, you, that just makes you like the crazy guy. Like, why would you be honest about that? Why would you have integrity about that? Why, why would you treat those people so kindly when they didn't treat you kindly? Uh, there's power in living your life fully for God. So I just want to say thank you. I want to live in a city where there's people like you who are trying to fight for faith uh, and not give up or give in about that. I don't know what your week's been like. My week's been good. I spent most of it memorizing the Old Testament, so that's been good. You know, uh, six months ago, I found out my back was better, but my hip was bad. And this morning, um, I was going back and forth from the office to the, to the church building here, and I was like limping across the street. I was like, ow, ow, ow. And I was like, God, this is not abundant living. I don't like this, right? I just want to remind you that even though you put God first in your finances, your life, you get up, you worship him, there is hardships in this life that we have. 
there is hardships. And sometimes you get these weird people who are like, well, you know, if you're serving God, everything should be perfect and rosy. And you should be having Skittles for lunch and hugging unicorns and things like that, right? <laughs> and I just want to remind you, we all have hardships in our lives. And when we choose to honor the Lord in spite of the hardships, I think that honors God the most. Like, I can serve God when everything's easy and things are going well. But when you serve God in the conflicts, in the struggles, in the pains, in the hurts of your life, and you don't let that pull you away from God, now that's faith. And that's rare. And that's what we have here in this church and in a lot of churches right around us. So that's not part of the message. I don't know why that's all coming out of me today, all right? <laughs> We're in a series on uh, generous living. Uh, we're, we're walking through the blessed life, and we're trying to meet people who live generous lives. Listen, if God gave everything to us, he gave life to us, he gave breath to us, like we don't have 100% of who we are without God, we have zero. We're nothing. We don't even have a chance to live life without him. He gave us everything we have first, and we come in the world with nothing, and we take nothing out. Everybody got that? So if that's true... Um, that we have this season of life where we get to honor God for a while. We want to do that really well. We want to uh, manage well what God has entrusted to us. So some of what we're talking about is money, but honestly, it's living an abundant life or a generous life in your life. Now, I've decided this. I want the blessing of God on my life. I do not want to try to live in this world without the blessing of God in my life. That just sounds painful. And that just doesn't sound fun. I, I want the blessing of God. Anything I can do to put the blessing of God in my life, if that's get up and, and, and participate in church gatherings, uh, if that's laying down my life for my family, if that's honoring God with my money, if that's choosing to have an attitude that, that honors Christ, if that's blessing the world around me, whether or not they, they uh, receive it, that's what I want to do because I want to make God proud. In fact, I want the way that you and I handle uh, these resources and money in our life. Listen, wouldn't it be great if we could say this? The way that you handle money honors God. That's a pretty cool thing to be able to say. The way that you handle money honors God, whether it's a lot or whether it's a little. Uh, I've learned some important money lessons in my life. Number one, I've learned that money is amoral, right? It's not good or bad. It's a tool that you can use for good and you can use for bad. It's amoral, all right? Uh, I've learned that when investing, uh, half the battle is buy low and sell high. Don't buy high and sell low, right? I've learned that houses and land appreciate and cars depreciate. So I'm never going to be that guy with that crummy rundown um, you know, place to live in with that gorgeous brand new $90,000 car. Um, probably not the, the wisest way to live. Um, listen, the reality is this. You want God's blessing in your life. You do. And, and there's two par paradigms in life. All I have is mine, I earned it, I made it, I achieved it, or everything is God's and I'm just managing some resources while I'm alive and then it's going to go on to somebody else. Um, it's all God's. The scripture says this in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, what do you have that God hasn't given you? And if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift? I love to tell the story of the first house. Uh, Stacy and I, I think I was 26 years old uh, when we got this house. And we bought a house, it was in 2001, it was the month before 9-11, we had a family member die, die in 9-11, so uh, on that day, so I remember that morning in our new living room, we just moved into this house and we got that phone call that, you know, we couldn't find uh, that person. But I remember being in that house and I, we had only lived in college dorms, we had been living in an apartment, we were on the third story, have you ever taken like 10 bags of plastic bag groceries up to like the, the third floor? And is anybody like me, it's like, I am not making multiple trips. Like, my hands are bleeding, and I'm not going up these stairs. And so I was like, man, I just want to, and I really wanted a dog. I wanted a dog. I was like, why are you buying a house? Because I want a dog. That's how bad I wanted a dog, right? And so, so we came across this house. We had an offer on the house. We bought this house. We were so excited. It was like $129,000, and I was scared to death to buy that home. And we bought that home, and, you know, they gave us the key. And the time they give you the key, and you, you know, it was a big deal. And so, you know, we walked through the house. We opened it up with our key. And I, I got to admit, honestly, like after living in apartments and dorms, I walked around like this. <laughs> like, like I was like, you know, I had, it was Dagon Towers that I just bought it, right? You know, that, that point one two acre. I mean, it was huge. <laughs> and, and it was almost 1,500 square feet. But I don't care, man. I was walking around that, and you would have thought like I was a land baron in all of Olympia, like... <laughs> I looked over at my wife, I'll never forget this, I looked at this little spindly maple tree, and I said, I said, honey, you see that tree? She's like, yeah. I said, I own that tree. 
Are you impressed? And I said, you see this dirt? I said, we own dirt. Like we have arrived. We own a piece of land. Now that lasted for about that long because then the mortgage started coming and I realized we, don't, we own 3% of this place, right? We got a long time to pay this thing off. And I started thinking about this very concept of stewardship and understanding that we are managers and not owners. And that's how we've chosen to live our lives. And I thought, you know, honestly, I don't own this. The bank owns this. But take it a step further, um, before the bank owned it, uh, for me, um, the person in front of me, they bought it, and the person in front of them bought it, and they really, they didn't own it, but honestly, the bank owned it, and before the bank owned that, some developer owned that, and then if you go back a little farther, some Native Americans owned that, and before that, the buffalo owned it. <laughs> it's just a piece of dirt, and it may pass in title to different people, but ultimately, like, I own nothing, and God owns the universe. So for some of us, thousands of dollars are going to go through our hands in our lives. But for others of us, millions of dollars are going to go through our hands. And as the people of God, we can do some really cool things with that. And my hope for you, I just, I just want to shamelessly just play, uh, pray, God bless your church. Because I want to see you have so much fun in giving uh, in your life. I really do. I think you're going to have a, a blast with that. If I get to be older and all my money go to medical bills, I will be destroyed and depressed because I'm living my life that one day we could just, just go like answer needs, go on mission trips, give money away, help young people, you know, leave diapers on doorsteps. That's going to be like a fun part of life. Uh, that's my plan. And hopefully that'll all work out. But really, we understand that everything is God's and nothing is really ours. We are just managers for a while. I love the, the parable of the talents when Jesus tells that parable where one was given five really uh, bags of silver and one, two, and one was given one. And, and the one with five, uh, Jesus tells the parable and the story comes back and doubles and the one, two, doubles it. And the one with one says, well, I knew you were hard, so I just buried it. I did nothing with it, with what you gave me. And as we read that scripture, I think it's so important that we understand, that we grasp, that God expects you to do something with what he's entrusted to you. Amen? He's, he expects you to do something with what he's entrusted to you. Um, and, and if you, you know, for, for all things you could do, just the main thing, don't do nothing. Don't just bury your talents. Don't just bury your, your, your abilities and your time and your passions and your resources. Do something with what God's entrusted to you. One day you and I will be held accountable to that. So give to the Lord in your life. Give to the Lord and, and pay your taxes. Uh, Jesus said like this, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. It's pretty obvious right there. Make sure you pay your tithes. You give to God first. Make sure you pay your taxes. And, and if anybody's not right there, it's like, okay, here we go. What are we going to do about that? What are we going to do about that? What Jesus said. Um, I want to take it a little further. Uh, I want to encourage you with a few other things about money. Uh, I want to challenge you to limit or curb your spending. Don't be American when it comes to your spending. Right? I'm an American. I'm supposed to overbuy. I'm supposed to overeat. It's how we do things around here. Right? And be, be smart about what you, how you spend your money. Um, get out of debt. Oh, I just wish that the church had zero debt so we could just have fun uh, doing the life and, and living the life that God's called us to live. Uh, forgive yourself for past money mistakes. How many have ever made a mistake with money? Yeah, you invested in Kodak and the newspaper business, and uh, uh, I don't know what it was that you did. Uh, maybe you got in a car wreck. Maybe you forgot something. It cost you a great deal. Maybe you made a bad investment or trusted the wrong person, and on and on it goes. Listen, I love this, that God is so forgiving, we can forgive ourselves for the mistakes we've made in the past. Even if it set your family back, forgive yourself and move forward in your life. Um, start saving now. Uh, take care of your family. The Bible is really clear, like, hey, you need, to, you need to look out for your family. You need to honor God, and you need to take care of your family. Uh, you need to use wealth to gain wisdom. In fact, the scripture says, what use is money in the hand of a fool? Since he has no idea that he needs to use that to gain wisdom. And then uh, I want to challenge you with this. Be happy for others when they are blessed. When someone's blessed, let the first words be out of your mouth be, I'm so happy for you. And bless them in that. Don't let that seed of envy get a, a root in your life. So uh, how well are you managing what God has entrusted to you? And by the way, if you're a parent far greater than money, God's entrusted a life to you. He's entrusted a life to you. If you're a grandparent, how can you invest in that kid 
Um, because that's really being entrusted with something, with a person, with a person's life. So let's live generously. Let's live generously with our words of affirmation, with uh, the way that we help others with forgiveness. Let's live generously in forgiveness. Let's apologize generously. I don't know that I've ever said it just like that. Would you be a person who apologizes generously? Not like, I'm sorry, because you did that when you were four, okay? So you've grown up a little bit. Let's be people who apologize generously. Uh, let's uh, honor God with our resources other than money. And, and so today we're going to talk about this principle of firsts. Um, the principle of first. Um, honor the Lord with what he's allowed you to have in your life and this principle of first. So let me just uh, start for a moment. I'm going to use a TV here. In the 1400s, I wasn't alive then, but in the 1400s, a new word was formed in the English language. It was a new word. And the word was uh, Priority. This word priority, it meant the very first or the prior thing. So uh, if you were alive in the 1400s, they would say there is this word called priority. There is no such thing as priorities because there can only be one prior thing. Go ahead and go to the next two lines, if you will. So what is the very first? Like what is the most important thing? In the 1400s, everybody had a priority. It was a person, it was a place, it was a thing. What was most important? And what must come prior or before everything else? Now, if you said to somebody in the 1400s, like, what are your priorities? They would look at you like you're on drugs. Like you can't have more things that come first. There's only one that can come first. Every, everything else is second, third, and fourth. And so how can that possibly uh, be? Uh, One thing and only one thing can come prior to everything else. But then we thought we were really smart in the 1900s, so we came up with priorities, all right? So let's talk about what priorities are. All the things that must come prior or first, all right? So priorities, all the things, not the one thing. Now we decide all the things that must become prior or first. Go to the next one. And then um, we somehow decided that we could have multiple firsts. So, you know, so here's the deal. Like, my spouse is number one in my life, and my health is number one in my life, and my job is number one, and my finances are number one, and my son is number one, and my daughter is number one. Oh, and, and God's number one, too. And somebody in the 1400s would be like, how do you have eight things that are first? Don't you get it? There's one thing that is prior, that is first, that is before, that is above everything else in your life. Interesting how we somehow try to have, by the way, have you ever tried to make seven things number one in your life? You make them all mad, right? It doesn't work. It's maddening. It's impossible. Uh, Listen, if you make the Lord number one in your life, you'll be a better spouse. Like if Stacey said, hey, babe, you're going to be number one in my life. like That's going to not work real real, well for us. How about I be number two? How about God be number one, right? Uh, You'll be a better parent if God's number one in your life. You'll be a better boss. Other teenagers will want to be around you if, if you make God number one in your life. So you can't have multiple prior things. There is one and only one thing that can be number one in your life. Everything else, if you're honest, has to start at number two. Jesus made it clear, if God is first in your life, then everything will come into order. If God is first, then everything will come into order. There it is. Amen. I knew somebody was out there. All right, good. Somebody at home in their dinosaur pajamas said amen. I I just believe that and I trust that. All right. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So if your life is centered around Jesus, your values will show that. So I have a powerful question. I want you to consider it as I ask this question today. Have you chosen to honor the Lord first? Like, is God really prior? Is he priority number one? Have you chosen to honor the Lord first above all else? Because if you have, according to Jesus, then your life falls into order. By the way, if you don't put God first in your life and you have all these other things first, your life falls out of order. That's what the Bible says. And it's easy for us to find ourselves there. So before you honor or pay homage to anyone or anything else, have you decided to honor the Lord first? your world. So we're in this series and we're reading, uh, we're walking through uh, this series on the blessed life. And uh, Robert Morris is a pastor in Texas. He uh, was a drug user. He was a drug dealer. He got saved. He gave his life to Jesus. He pastors a mega church in uh, the Dallas area. And um, honestly, he's become someone uh, who many, many of us in the church have appreciated because he takes this stewardship money thing really seriously and does it really well. 
He doesn't preach anything like God wants to make you. Well, throw that out the window, right? Um, but he also has a high challenge to the church uh, when it comes to money. And some of us in ministry, we don't want to teach about money because we don't want all the emails like, oh, the church just wants money. And he said, no, I'm not going to shrink back from teaching what the Bible says. And so I appreciate him so much. He's lived an incredibly generous life. And I want to read to you just one uh, quick story um, from his life. This is the one I've been sharing the most because I love it so much. He says, as we were young, I was a traveling evangelist. All of my income came from the love offerings I received from churches in which I preached. In those years, my income offering from offerings might be $800 one week and only $200 the next week. Debbie and I just never knew. But early in our marriage, we had learned to trust God where our finances were concerned. We were diligent tithers. God had spoken clearly to us about the principle of the tithe several years earlier. And ever since we uh, began honoring the Lord by giving the first tenth of everything that came in, our needs have always been met, sometimes miraculously. What we didn't know was that God was about to take us, up, uh, take us to the next level. As I mentioned before, uh, about, a, about a month before the surprise blessing at the gas station, God did something remarkable to get my attention uh, where the matter of giving was concerned. This is what he says. I was scheduled to preach at a church for only one night, and as it turned out, it was the only meeting I was scheduled to preach at all month. One chance to create income for my whole family for the whole month. From a fin financial standpoint, that meant us only having one opportunity to receive an offering instead of the usual four, five, or six. Although Debbie and I had grown in our ability to trust God and rest in God, this represented a budgeting challenge in the making. At the close of the service, the church received a love offering on my behalf, and shortly thereafter, the pastor approached me with an envelope. He said, Robert, I'm pleased to, and amazed to tell you this. This is the largest love offering this little church has ever given. Largest this little church has ever given. Um, God used you to bless us tonight, and I'm happy to be able to give this to you. When I opened up the envelope, I found a check for roughly the same amount as our entire monthly budget in just one meeting at this small church. God had miraculously provided, and it normally took several meetings to produce. It was quite a lesson for us, but the lesson wasn't over yet. As I stood there holding that check, basking in the warm glow of gratitude and wonder, something happened to me that forever changed me and the course and the quality of my life. And I would suggest that perhaps this story changed tens of thousands of lives. Early in the beginning of that service, a missionary had given a brief testimony and an update on the congregation. And now as I looked across the nearly empty sanctuary, I caught sight of him, this missionary. As I did, the unmistakable voice of the Lord spoke to my heart, I want you to give him your offering, all of it. In an instant, I went from euphoria to something of approximating panic. Lord, that can't be your voice. I mean, after all, I, you, you just did a miracle here to meet our needs. And once again, the instruction came through gently but clearly, I want you to give him your offering. Like a kid who doesn't want to hear is what his brother is saying. I wanted to stick my fingers in my ears and sing, la, 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 I can't hear you. <laughs> give him the whole offering. Trust me. Trust me. I couldn't shake it off. I tried to rationalize. I tried bargaining. I tried begging. The impression only grew stronger. Ultimately, I waved the white flag and I said, okay, Father, I trust you. I endorsed the back of the check, folded it in half, and took a quick glance around the room to make sure no one was watching. Walking up to the missionary, I said something like this. I really appreciate your testimony tonight. Please don't tell anyone about this, but I would like you to have this offering. The check is made out to me, but I've signed it over to you. And I handed him the check and I walked away. An hour later, I found myself seated with 20 members of the church at a pizza place. Across from me sat a well-dressed man I barely knew. After a while, we, he leaned across the table toward me, looked me straight in the eyes, and he asked me a shockingly personal question. How much was your offering tonight? Naturally, the question flustered me. But I'd never had anyone ask me that before, especially a near stranger. His boldness caught me off guard. I didn't know what else to do, uh, but I answered him. So I told him the amount of the offering. And I remember that it was, uh, that that wasn't, hoping that that was the end of it, but it wasn't. In the same authoritative manner, he asked me another question. Where is the check? What nerve, I remember thinking. What is he up to? Of course, I no longer had the check, but I wasn't about to tell him that. Um, so I'm not proud to tell you this, but this preacher lied through his teeth. Uh, my wife has it, <laughs> I said nervously. She was sitting at the other end of the long table, a nice, safe distance away. Now, can we change the subject? 
go get it, I want to see it. <laughs> the man was relentless. Not knowing what else to do, I made a pretense of getting up and going to ask her uh, for the check. Bending down closer to her ear, I asked, how's your pizza? Good, she replied, <laughs> giving me a perplexed look. Great, glad to hear it. Just checking, I muttered, and I headed back down to the table to my seat. My ears heard another lie floating past my lips. She left it out in the car, I said. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <clears throat> Trying to sound like it was a very, very long ways away. At this point, not only was I trying to hide the fact that I gave my whole love offering away, but I was also covering the fact that this evangelist, who had just spent the evening proclaiming that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, had just lied. As tiny beads of perspiration began to pop on my face, the gentleman leaned across the table and got uncomfortably close. The check's not in the car, Robert, he stated with a low voice. How do you know that, I responded, sounding a little offended, because God told me. And he told me something else. At this point, the man spoke words that have rolled like thunder through my life ever since. God is about to teach you about giving so that you can teach the body of Christ. And with that, he slid a folded piece of paper across the table. It was a check. The amount to the penny was 10 times the amount I had just given away an hour earlier. Ten times to the penny. That was the night this journey started. Is that an incredible story? Of learning to trust God, of learning to put him first, living the adventurous life of generous living. I think the life that's not a life of generous living honestly gets kind of boring. That sounds like a fun life to live. And the scripture says so clearly that God does honor us when we put him first. Let me give you quickly some points here. Uh, Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. This is what it says. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Like honor the Lord first with what comes in. Since everything is God's and we don't have life or breath without him, make sure you honor the Lord and you honor him second. Like no, you, you honor the Lord first, right? You honor the Lord first in your life. So here's point number one. Give the Lord your first and your best. If anyone deserves your first and your best, it's God. He's given you life. Give the Lord your first and your best. The scripture in the NLT says this, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything that you produce. Give God the best part of everything you produce. In that culture, a farming culture, an agricultural uh, you know, culture, we understand that. They had to honor the Lord the best part that they produced. And uh, listen, for us today, the first part of your day, we call it our quiet time. Let's give God that time. The first part of your money is called your tithe. The first part of your week is called Sunday. We set aside the first part of our week and say, God, I want to honor you. I want this week to be right. Give God the best of your energy in your life. Some of you, I've seen you in the morning. The morning is not the best time for you to spend time with God, all right? <laughs> Do it at night when you have energy. You're awake and you're alive, okay? Give God your best energy. Give to God with an open hand, not a closed fist. Someone said, if he can get it through you, he can get it to you. So be a conduit of blessings in your life, and you'll experience God's blessing. This is what the scripture says, the next verse. Then he will fill your barns with grain. There it is. And your vats will overflow with good wine. God likes to reward his kids. The first thing I do with money is give to the Lord. The first payment you give is always to God. Uh, in fact, I have the, just the 10% taken out of my paycheck and sent directly to God right away. Because if your salary, you already know what the amount is, right? You just do that. We give our tithe on faith. We bring the first 10% to the house of the Lord, and we give, and the rest of it is redeemed. If you really look at the scripture, it actually says that the, when you give to God the first 10%, the 90% is blessed. And we don't like to talk about this, but it says if you don't, then really your money's cursed. It's not blessed. It's actually kind of cursed. It doesn't preach real well, but that's what the Bible really says. When you honor God with your life, when you make him first in your life, everything else falls into order. The Lord needs to be first, not last. Uh, life changes when God is first. So let's don't fit God in somewhere. Let's make him first in our lives. The second thing is this. God asks for your best, not your leftovers. Sometimes we're guilty of giving the most important people in our life our leftovers. If that's happening with your family, do something to change that. If that's happening with God, do something to change that. Don't give God your leftovers. God's asked for your best. Exodus 23 says this, As you harvest your crop, crops, bring the very best of the first harvest to the house of the Lord your God. The first fruits, if you will. 
Bring it to the house of the Lord. Um, Really, it says bring it, not just give, because you can't give what doesn't really belong to you. And, And God says, actually, that's mine, so honor me with that and then give offerings beyond that. It takes faith to believe that 90% will go farther uh, than 100%. God can do more with 90 than you can do with 100. Um, Don't pay for everything else and see if you have enough money left over for God. Don't give God your leftovers. In in Scripture, in Genesis chapter uh, 4, there's a story about Cain and Abel, if you remember that story. And this is what it says. Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. I just want to take a real quick poll. How many would prefer to work with the animals and how many would like to work with the crops? How many say, I'd like to work with the animals? How many say, I'd like to work with the crops? How many like, want to work with computers in the 21st century? That sounds better. <laughs> it doesn't smell as bad. You know, it's not as hard to labor on your back, right? Some of you are like, neither, all right? So Abel works the flocks and Cain works the soil. In the course of time, this, this is an important phrase, in the course of time, over, over the time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Doesn't sound like uh, prior, doesn't sound like first, doesn't sound like best. Over the course of time, uh, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But listen to this, Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. Do you see the difference? The very first and the very best. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor, so Cain was angry and his face was downcast. Isn't it interesting that we make decisions and then if we don't get what we want, sometimes we go, how come, right? Listen, in that culture, if you had a lamb and you were given the first lamb, you were to sacrifice the first lamb to God, you had no promise that that, that, that you was gonna have nine more lambs, Right? When that firstborn was born and you gave that to God, that was trust. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to give you the first. And I'm going to hope. I'm going to believe in faith that there's going to be enough to take care of my family. That takes guts. That is faith. That is courage in our lives. Leviticus said it like this. One-tenth of the produce of the land, whether from the grain or the fields or the fruit of the trees, belongs to the Lord. And you must set apart to him as holy. Wherever the first 10% goes, that's who's first. God is prior in our lives. That's what the scripture says. And here's number three. When you give uh, God your first and best, he blesses the rest. Let me just uh, take a moment. I brought 10 $1 bills here with me today. And, and so you can count this off. I look like a banker, don't I? You, you know, if you don't have a lot of money, just get ones. It makes you feel better about life, Okay. <laughs> Now, what's interesting about the, the scripture, all the principle of first and first fruits and what God says is honor me first and, and, and with your best, and then let me, let me bless you in your life. I think a lot of times we kind of go mortgage, insurance, car, food, groceries, on and on it goes, credit card bill. And the reality is we get to the last one and we go, okay, do I have anything left for God? Well, not the full 10%, but I'll give him something. That's honestly probably a really common story in the world of people who follow Jesus and believe the Bible. Kind of wait till we get to the end and see what we got. And this is what the scripture says. God, mortgage, insurance, grocery store. And we figure that out as we go because we give to God first. And what God says is these nine are going to take care of you when you honor me with your first and your best. And that's a challenge for us today. And my hope as I read the scripture for you is that when you give God the first, that you get to see God's hand of favor and blessing in your life. I'm not even thinking about the church at all, right? I'm just thinking about you. Like, wouldn't it be cool to go, God, I don't know how it works, but I'm giving you the first and the best in my life because I want your favor and blessing in my life. Amen? When you give God your first and your best, he blesses the rest, that's what he does. That's who he is in our lives. It's clear that God expects you to do something with what he's given you in this life. So let's make a decision today. Man, every dollar, every minute, every ability, every talent that I have, I want to honor the Lord first. Put the Lord first, your marriage is better. Put the Lord first, you're a better parent. Put God first and let his blessing and favor be over your life. Listen up. When you and I stop and realize who the Lord is and what he's done for you and for me, 
we give joyfully and generously. We just do. When we realize we have nothing, God, we're sinners locked out of heaven without you. We don't even have life or breath with you. You ask for 10%, and then you're going to give abundantly beyond that. God, I can easily do that because I know who I am apart from you. And so I want you to be centered first, and I want to give you my best in my life. I'm going to ask if we could just take a moment and just wait on God. We're going to receive communion in just a minute, and if that's new to you, I'll explain that. Lord, today, I pray, God, that this church and people who follow you and and live out the scripture, God, today, we would never say or feel that you get what's left over, not in our finances, not in our day, not our leftover energy or our leftover time where we can squeeze you in. Lord, help us today to be the kind of people who honor the Lord first. Not over the course of time, do something, but Lord, that we would come to you and give you the absolute best, and it would be a joy to give to you. And so Lord, today I pray that as some are here and they're saying, God, I I really know what I need to do. I need to honor you before I honor anyone else. I need to give to you. I want to make you prior. Nothing before you. You are priority number one. And listen, maybe here today and God is priority number two, three, or four. Would you just take a moment today and just say, God, I'm reorganizing my life. Because if you are first, then everything falls in line. But if you're not, my life is out of order. And I want to pray just God's favor and blessing over your health, your relationships, your job. Lord, give us peace. Lord, would you bring joy in relationships and all the things that money can't buy to our lives. God, as a pastor, sometimes I just want to just pray heaps of blessings upon your people who serve you and honor you with their lives. And Lord, I do pray for supernatural blessing. Lord, let our lives be filled with laughter. Let our decisions be filled with faith. I pray, God, that this thing called money would not master us, but we would master it. God, take us on a journey like you've taken others and help us to live generous lives. Let it be an adventure and let it be a joy. And abundantly, God, bless your people, as your word says. And God, for that person who's just struggling with courage to honor you with finances, God, I just pray courage on that person, that they would test you in this and they would never go back. God, for that person whose marriage uh, won't allow forgiving, God, help them to give wherever and whatever they can as they honor their spouse. And Lord, I pray that leaders in their home would model for their entire family what it is to put God first in your life. As we spend some time just kind of waiting on God, we're going to receive communion. Um, When you came in, you should have received a little um, traveling cup, which I managed to lose on mine. Um, but you can rip off the top. You can kind of pull off the one that's for juice and the one for bread. If you do it now, oh, thank you so much. If you do it now, you might spill it, but go ahead and do it if you want. Um, why, why do we do this? Why do we receive communion? Not only did Jesus know that money was going to be the number one rival for your attention probably in life, but Jesus also knew the condition of humans to forget the resurrection, to take for granted something that we should know. 
So Jesus, at that last supper, he actually said very clearly what was going to happen. My body is going to be broken. My blood is going to be poured out. They may not have understood, but that's not the kind of language you want to hear your teacher, your friend, your leader say, someone you love. My body's going to be broken. My blood's going to be poured out. What are you talking about, Jesus? No one fully understood it except Jesus. He was alone in his understanding of the agony he was going to face to go to the cross, the innocent Lamb of God, the first offering as Jesus gave his life for your sins and for mine. The Bible says you don't have to pay penance for your sins. You don't have to try to, you know, figure it all out. Be good enough. You come to the Lord and say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I messed up. When you confess your sins, he is faithful to forgive your sins. Amen. And so we don't live in shame, but we stop and we recognize, Lord, there's some areas in my life I'm not proud of, and I'm a major work in progress. And so, God, during this time, I'm going to search my heart as we worship, as we pray. And Lord, if there's changes that need to happen, if there's forgiveness that needs to happen in me, if there's somebody I need to forgive or someone I need to ask forgiveness of, then I'm going to take these next few minutes and pray about that. If something comes to your mind during this time at home or here, and you're like, man, that, <sighs> confess that to the Lord. Ask him to forgive you and receive God's incredible, amazing grace. So I'm going to ask the team to lead us in a song. Would you just maybe just spend a few minutes with the Lord just talking to him and invite his uh, light to shine on your life. And would you confess any areas that you know don't honor God? And let's take a moment. And once everybody's done that, we'll actually receive the bread and the cup together. All right? left. 
Lord, we are so grateful that you gave everything. You did, you laid down your very life that our impurity would not keep us from heaven, that our selfishness wouldn't banish us from your presence. Lord, hell is not our destiny, not because we live such holy, perfect lives. It is because of what you have done for us. So Lord, in a spirit of gratitude, just thank you. You gave all of yourself for us. So Lord, today, we give our lives back to you. If you're here today and you need to commit or recommit your life to the Lord, right where you are, where you just say, God, I don't have it all figured out. I got some issues and some problems but I really do want you to be Lord of my life. Not a friend, not a life coach, not a buddy. I want you to be Lord of my life. And if you're not willing yet to submit your life to the Lord and trust Him, then I want to encourage you to keep pressing in until you are. His plan for your life is better than yours. And He's the only one that has the power to forgive your sin so that you might enter into the kingdom of heaven. The Apostle Paul said, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On that night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks for it. He broke that bread in pieces and he said, This is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Let's eat the bread together. In the same way, knowing the destruction, honestly knowing the torture that was to come in the next few hours, 
Jesus picked up a cup of wine and he said this cup it represents the new covenant between God and his people it's a new agreement confirmed with my blood the entire Old Testament spoke of the one who would come and set things right and Jesus would sacrifice his life no more animal sacrifice an agreement now confirmed with the blood of the Son of God. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's drink the cup. I want all of God's grace, all of God's forgiveness, because I need it. Person next to you, you may look pretty good, but they need a lot of forgiveness. And if you're honest, the person in the mirror needs God's grace as well. Amen. And thanks for pressing in, for putting God first in your life. Uh, go today, uh, honor God, and be blessed by the Lord. Be a blessing. Make sure you encourage someone else, especially if you're here live. Encourage someone else before you leave the campus today. All right? God bless you.